Hello, uh, welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us for this uh, artist talk with uh, two very talented artists uh, you're going to get to meet and hear all about their amazing work. Uh, we're here to discuss uh, the current exhibition on at the Silk Purse Arts Center uh, entitled Panorama Personal, Present and Past featuring the artwork of Colette Tan and Rick Herdman. Uh, my name is Stephen Snyder. I am the Gallery and Communications Coordinator for the West Vancouver Community Arts Council. I will be your host this evening. Uh, if you would like to leave a comment or a question for our two talented artists, you can drop those in the chat and we will get to it uh, a little later in this conversation. Uh, so, as I said, this exhibition is here at the Silk Purse Arts Center, uh, which is in West Vancouver, right next to John Lawson Park, on the unceded and traditional territories of the Coast Salish peoples. Uh, here on the North Shore, that means the Squamish Nation, the Tsleil-Waututh Nation, and the Musqueam Nation. And as settlers and guests, we are incredibly grateful to our host nations and community members and neighbors for their stewardship of these lands since time immemorial. And the relationship uh, to the land and to the person is a little bit uh, about what you might hear tonight when discussing uh, the artwork that's on display, which you can see a little bit behind me. Uh, it's a beautiful show. Uh, it is here at the Silk Purse until uh, May 28th, the year 2023. Uh, so please, uh, if you're watching this while the exhibit is still up, uh, come on down and have a look at it. So uh, it is two fantastic artists, Rick Herdman, uh, a printmaker currently based in Burnaby, and Colette Tan, a painter uh, here on the North Shore. So without further ado, let's meet our talented artists. Uh, let's start, uh, let's go alphabetically. Rick, why don't you please uh, introduce yourself to everyone watching? Uh, I'm Rick Herdman. I am a printmaker and a sculptor and living in North Burnaby. Um, I've traveled throughout the province uh, many times, uh, getting my inspirations from the nature around me, currently working on series regarding place and time, and uh, very happy to be connected with the Silk Purse Gallery in the West Bend Community Ce uh, Art Centre. Awesome. Thanks so much, uh, Rick. That was great. Great to meet you. Uh, Colette, could you please introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Colette. Nice to meet all of you. And thank you, Stephen, um, for hosting us. And I uh, also want to thank um, West Van Arts Council for the opportunity to talk about art and for this amazing exhibit. Uh, I'm really thrilled to have um, this amazing exhibition with Rick. Um, so I'm raised and born in um, Singapore, but I'm now based here. Uh, I'm a painter, an abstract artist, actually. Um, um, I, well, a little about myself. I always loved art as a young, as a little girl, but never really get to use acrylic paint. <laughs> it's only with pencil and paper. And I told myself, if you give me a pencil and a paper, I would do art. So that has been my philosophy. But anyway, I didn't get my formal training till I was in grade six. Um, I was enrolled in the um, art elective program in Singapore, and that's where I received four-year training from a group of teachers from the United Kingdom. But after that, I did not continue in my pursuit of art, because I think in uh, Southeast Asia countries, you know, it's hard to survive if you're an artist. <laughs> that's what we used to believe, <laughs> maybe still now. So uh, I came to Vancouver with my family in 2016, and in 2018, I was diagnosed with cancer. And um, it's because of this cancer journey that I, I was on, uh, I, I found the reason of my of being alive back again. So I uh, became an artist in 2018, you know, in 2020. See, I can't even remember the dates. <laughs> um, so I started painting again after um, stopping for about three, two to three decades, or at least 20 over years, um, back at my kitchen table. And then um, I was, I got involved in the East Van, um, East Side Van, uh, East Side Culture Crawl two years ago, and the rest is history. And now I'm, I have my second studio in North Vancouver, and I'm excited to do more work. Wow. 
Excellent. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your journey, Colette. Uh, pretty, pretty great stories uh, from both of you, your, your journey to becoming here. And we'll definitely hear uh, more from you throughout the evening on what you do and why you do it. Uh, so, but first, uh, to give everyone here a, a quick sample of what they can expect when they come to see the exhibit, we're going to take a little a little tour around the gallery here. Now, this is, you know, uh, doesn't do the artwork nearly uh, the justice it deserves. It's you really have to come and see it uh, to really uh, take in the full. Uh, majesty and and magnitude of, uh, of this fantastic artwork. So we're going to get to that uh, just now. Okay. So, uh, this is this is what you'll see as you uh, come in off of our uh, street entrance here to the silk purse. Let's get rid of this so you start in. You get uh, some really great, lovely uh, smaller prints and cards of Rick's in these more uh, smaller uh, works here by Colette. Yeah, and then we move into uh, Rick's uh, larger scale print work. Which, as everyone can see, uh, it's very detailed. And a very interesting format, I have to say. Uh, these dimensions, Rick, are uh, a, a little a little uncommon. I was really pleased to see uh, pleased to see the size and, and dimensions and, and scale of these pieces. Very interesting. It's a very interesting choice. Yeah, they're four feet by 11 inches, so. Yeah, there's some materials where you can learn a little bit more about our artists when you come visit. Now to see some, some of Colette's work on a bit of a larger scale. Uh, again, a real uh, interesting decision in dimensions um, that you're working with, Colette. Just like Rick, there's things that maybe you don't see all of the time, right? Another another long panorama, um, little tiny square, some round, some round pieces. It makes for a, an interesting exhibition, I think, because it, it gives people shapes and ways to view artwork that maybe they aren't used to all the time. And everyone watching, um, you might be able to tell uh, that Colette's paintings are all, they're all done on wood. And a great use of color, I have to say, uh, with both of you. Um, 
Sometimes it's uh, very stark black and white or a lot of monochromes or maybe just, just a, a hint of like a yellow amid some blues and grays, but, uh, but it's actually a very effective use of color. And everyone watching, you can kind of probably pick up on some themes in, in each artist's work in terms of subject and, and style. A lot of inspiration um, as, as both artists, Rick and Klaus, but as you both said in your introductions about uh, nature and place and a sense of that and how maybe it makes you feel. As, as everyone watching can you know maybe see there's there's a really great uh, contrast uh, in both of these bodies of work. Um, something here like as we're seeing with Colette is very uh, a little amorphous and, and ethereal and, and lots of uh, shapes and colors blending together um, whereas you think about what we just saw from Rick, there's a lot of like clean lines and clear definition between uh, objects or patterns or color. So it's a pretty, uh, that's also a pretty exciting thing to see. I think makes for a great viewing experience when you can see the differences and similarities between artwork. Excellent. Uh, so that is, uh, that's the show. That is Panorama, Personal, Present, and Past here at the uh, Silk Purse Arts Center. Uh, a quick taste for everyone. Uh, if you can, please come on down and see it up close. You can see all of the fine details, amazing textures, beautiful color blending. So it's a pretty, a pretty stunning, stunning exhibition. Thank you both for, for being a part of the show. It's, uh, it's been a real pleasure so far. Lots of, lots of great feedback. Thank you. So now we're going to hear a bit more from each artist. Uh, they've each chosen uh, one work that's on display um, and go a little bit more in depth on it, uh, sort of give you uh, a bit of an idea of what their process is like, what their inspirations might be. Uh, so let's start off with uh, with Rick. We have a really great print of yours uh, that we're going to pull up uh, right now. Yes. Yes, please, Rick, tell us about this fantastic print. Okay. Um... Sorry, I'm having a video problem here all of a sudden. I've lost control of my screen here. Oh, <laughs> my back. Um, so we're looking at uh, Elder Cedar and, um, sorry, I've lost track of what you guys are looking at right now. Oh, uh, so we are uh, just looking at um, at the actual artwork. Just in the actual print? Okay, so yep. I can explain it from there. Uh, the print is based on a forest area that you walk in quite a bit. Uh, the interesting part is the, the forest is called our Elder Cedar, but I adjusted some of the um, elements in it to tell a story of the growth of the forest in that. Um, uh, Steve, do you mind if I switch to my camera where I've got in front of me? I don't know how that works for you. Yeah, definitely. Let me... Okay. Uh... It'll probably be easier because then I can point... Yeah. And I sort of lost track of seeing what you're seeing. Yeah, so now everyone should see uh, see your camera. Okay, so this is my camera here now. Uh, so this is the print I'm talking about, Elder Cedar here. Uh, what's going on in the forest is it's the 
uh, evolution of the forest and the fir trees here are starting to fall down as the cedar trees are finding new pathways through the forest. Uh, and that's literally the title is the cedars are becoming the uh, now the new elders in the forest as the change is happening. There's other trees are falling down and the firs are starting to disappear as the uh, evolution of the forest usually does. Uh, this goes on to the theories of my, my prince of the um, of place and time. And these go into the other ones that are in there of some photos that are, um, images are based on my great uncle's photos. Uh, and in this case, the elder cedar one uh, is more about the replication in nature and how growth appears over time. Uh, in this case, I've added a little bit of light that can come into it. And there's some water where we have little moments of breath. Whereas other areas are the dense, intense forests that many of us are coming to love as just a giant hug within living within the forest and that density of space and trying to uh, capture that in uh, a way that's just only linear lines where I don't have shading to be able to work with that, be able to create senses of spaces and depth within that is one of the challenges of being a printmaker. Uh, we don't have tonal quality unless we add in a second plate to be able to accomplish that, which in other prints you, in within the, um, the show, you may see that there's color added, and those require more than one plate in that case to do this. For those unfamiliar with the printmaking, I'm just going to pull this aside for a second. You're going to quickly see a print I'm working on. But what I want to show you is uh, this is the plate from the Elder Cedar one. and there is a um, everywhere where I've I cut in is where it's white. So my chisel's up here. I'll go in and I'll carve all the lines, and that becomes the white line. So I'm working in uh, reverse. I I work in the white and I leave the black. And another confusing part, as you know from your print makes maybe know from printmaking, is it prints in reverse. So the tree lays this way in that one, and it prints this way. So I'm working in reverse in um, negative when I'm making a print. And there's the two of them together there. Um, back to this view for you, Stephen. That's great to see. That's fantastic. So was this uh, was this uh, based upon like a photograph you took or a photograph that was from this collection that you mentioned uh, that was belonging to your great uncle or was this completely kind of fabricated? This is a bit of photos, a bit of fabrication. There's about a 50-50 creation and fabrication within here. Um, ref lots of reference photos because this location doesn't really look like this. But I was able to get something inspiration from it. Of course, then I changed the composition to be able to tell stories. I use um, golden sections a lot, and there's a lot of math sometimes hidden inside there. I'll do pre drawings, like uh, this, the newest one I'm working on. It has a lot of pre drawings that you may not see within it. The eye lines of things run into each other, and they've got sectioned out. So I I'm, I pay a lot of attention to my co composition before I go after cutting it because. One of the things about uh, printmaking is, is it takes a really long time to cut that plate. So I want to be sure when I go into it and I can't erase a mistake. So if I've cut it, it's almost impossible to say I have to make work it in. There's a couple of tricks, but they never really work well. Um, when you're referencing the ones from my great uncle, those are um, a, a series that connects loosely with this one, but more specifically where it's footsteps and times, literally imprints and times. I'm almost always in my brain is this concept of the ancestor and the, the ones following it in the sense of a tree growing, the leaves come off the tree or the, the seeds fall off the tree and they become an, um, a, a replication of the ancestor. And in the case where my great uncle's pictures that we talked about earlier, um, that is that sort of concept as well, where it's where he's been, where I've been. Um, and in this case here is this one's Colony Farm, which is a place I grew up walking around on. This is the one the one's hanging in the, your show right now. 
And I didn't know he had ever been there until I went through the photo archives and I found out that him and I had walked in the exact same places and he had done um, panoramas as well. That must be uh, an interesting feeling to see that sort of tangible connection to the past sort of come alive in, in a new work. Very much. And I, I think for the, because I've never met him, um, we, we, our timelines didn't cross. And I, I start thinking about these imprints that I'm leaving and um, hopefully they'll outlast me in some ways and inspire somebody else. Yeah. Kind of speaking about permanence uh, versus impermanence sort of to a degree, printmaking is one of those things where you make a limited number of uh, one image. So you can make multiples of an image, but it's a very, uh, you choose what your finite amount of images is. Why was this form of art making, uh, what drew you to that? to doing something where you could make copies, uh, but then you'll stop and then never go back to that image again? Well, that's a really good question, Stephen. Um, <laughs> um, what drew me to it? Capilano College drew me to printmaking. I, I did my fine arts at Cap College and I like dreamed of painting and, and drawing was what I did in high school. But I just absolutely fell in love with printmaking up at um, Cap College and with some amazing instructors, best place. Some I can't say enough about walking in the forests up there as well and doing printmaking. And um, I guess why I, I do printmaking is uh, it just makes sense to my hands. I'm a, as a sculptor and carver, it, 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 the, the, this movement of the, the material. And when I'm thinking at, at I'm looking at Colette stuff, uh, the, the beauty of the wood grains turned into the artwork itself. And I look at that all the day. That's why I don't do lino, I do woodcuts. And because of that grain, I have to work with it and fight against it within the work. With lino, it, it cuts too easy for me. It goes the right way all the time. I want that life of the wood in it. So I think I'm really honored to be with Colette in the sense seeing how well those two mash together that the grain of the wood comes through. And in some of my works, I'm trying to encourage the grain to come through or encourage anyways mistakes and um, the way the grain is teaching me how to carve. And I think in some ways I'm seeing some subtleties of how Colette's grains come forward and uh, just thrilled to see that as well. Another artist inspired by those things. Fantastic. Thanks, Rick. So I think that's a, a great way to move into uh, checking out uh, a piece here from Colette. We're going to pull that up. And then if you want to tell us about this uh, fantastic painting. All right. Yep. Um, I chose this painting to um, talk about um, reason being, I thought I would end the uh, Mountain of Wood series with a bang, which is a big piece like this. <laughs> <laughs> but I might change my mind. <laughs> um, okay, a little bit similar to Rick, I like to challenge myself. Um, although Rick um, mentioned that he tried to work against the wood grain, you know. Um, well, um, for my case, I work with the wood grains, right? So before I um, paint a uh, paint on a piece of panel uh, or even before I purchase a piece of wood panel the thing I look out for is actually the grains so if I can envision something and I knew that there's some potential in it I would buy the wood so I wouldn't know what I would paint on it or how the artwork would come out I would just let it be and then one day I would just paint on it <laughs> And they were just voila, you know, have a life on uh, on on his own. So um, this painting, I think, is meaningful because it has a few elements um, which um, represents um, the past two years of uh, um, uh, work on uh, wood that I've been working on. Um, it has the um, thick textures which you can see on the mountains. It also have the um, very light, um, um, what do you call it, acrylic wash 
uh, on the same piece of painting. So I personally um, like contrast in every piece of artwork. That is also why I'm very attracted to Rick's work, um, whereby you, you just see very deep contrast. The, like um, the black is the darkest and the white is just the paper white, really white. So um, I limit the use of my color to one. If you didn't notice, most of my paintings are um, only in one color. <laughs> Actually, if you do not consider white and black as colors. Um, so what I want to emphasize on this painting is the mountains, uh, in all my work, I want to inspire hope. So um, with the different use of one medium, one color, like uh, acrylic paint and just blue, I'm able to express, in, I challenge myself to um, express in ways whereby I can um, exemplify how um what how do you put it in words like i try to push the limit with it with the limited medium that i use okay and while i paint the mountains represents like um something that is that is like um they were even here even before humankind were being created yeah uh, if you i mean when um rick talked about the pictures, the photos of his own uncle. It reminds me of um, some photographs that I, I've seen of Vancouver like 100 years ago. The mountains were there, but there were no buildings. And now you look at a picture of Vancouver, they are filled with buildings, but the mountains are still there. The mountains are actually the same. <laughs> they never change. And they're beautiful. And their beauty lasts. That's mm -hmm. what amazed me. So um, when I paint mountains, it does give me a sense of hope to um, remind me of um, there's something that lasts and is a creation um, created by a creator. And that never change. Um, so even if things change or uh, we go through struggles or what, whatever it may be, I feel that uh, there's still something that I can lean on, you know, the mountains never fail me, even during winter when it's cold and it, the sky gets dark. But when it's during daytime, uh, the, the sky gets dark earlier. But during the daytime, I saw immense beauty, the glow that is um, glowing out from out of the uh, mountain top on my way to um, the studio all around Vancouver. It, that inspired me so much. And I thought I would end this series a year ago. <laughs> I'm still inspired by the mountains. I'm like, hello, <laughs> it's, the winter is over. <laughs> it's summer. <laughs> um, so, so um, yeah, and um, and if you and if you look closely at the painting, I left the top part of the painting um, in its original color. I didn't really want to cover it, and of course, um, one of the reason is to expose the wood grains, right? Um, there's a reason why I want to show the wood grains because it just reminds me of um, um, that I'm part of the creation. You know, the wood grains is like uh, our fingerprints and they are mm -hmm. unique. So we could either cover it up or we can let it speak and bring it out. And, and you know, like uh, in this case, this piece of painting, you know, um, the wood grains will be forever there for people to enjoy together with the painting. And it's a fun challenge for me to um, work together with the wood grains. It felt like I'm in, every time I create a piece of art, it's like a sacred experience, you know. I am not really the creator. I'm just being part of something greater. Um, so if you know, um, my paintings are all inspired by what's within. So it's, it's not like um, I can duplicate it just because it's beautiful. Um, I don't do that. I work based on what's within me. So, um, and this, this huge 44 inch uh, wood panel is a challenge for me to paint. First of all, <laughs> I can't put it, I can't prop it on a, on a anywhere it rolls. <laughs> Secondly, because of my uh, health reason, you know, um, my right arm is compromised. I couldn't, I have to pace myself. I, if I were to work on this, I may not be able to work on many other things for a while, <laughs> you know, that kind of, I really have to pace myself um, because I need a lot more strength and I need to work fast. Um, like 
like Rick, I think working on wood is rather unforgiving <laughs> <laughs> because they absorb paint like, like super fast. It's not like canvas. You can just, you know, move it around, wipe it away if you make a mistake. The moment you um, brush on it, it's stained forever. So um, if you want to have a many layers and depth of it, you have to work fast and yet it is it, a flow. So um, yeah, I'm glad how it turned out. And um, apart from the wood grains and the thick brush strokes, what I like is um, the fact that I just use one color. <laughs> mm. Rick, Rick uses, Rick is only black and white, no color, <laughs> maybe a bit of blue. It's very similar to me. Not because I'm lazy, I'm a lazy painter. <laughs> yeah, I was, I don't know. <laughs> I didn't want to say that, but I just like to keep things simple because I move so fast. I can't afford to think too much. If I think too much, I, I can't create, mm -hmm. you know? So, um, yeah. So, uh, I think I would make a couple of more of these big pieces and, um, let's see how you turn out. So this is my piece, which I named solo. It might not be solo anymore. <laughs> <laughs> It is, yeah. it is pretty large, like you mentioned, it's, it's a 44 inch diameter. It's a, it's a pretty big piece. It's, it's very striking too, um, because of the artwork itself, but also yeah. because you've chosen it as a circle, like you said, so. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. It's even hard to make it balance, you know, to, mm. to <laughs> and I never use ruler in my art. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that's great because it, like you're saying, you're trying to just capture this this feeling, this 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 the, yes. the, the spirit of what you're trying to get out, and and that uh, having maybe some so many rules and straight lines, you know, and and, and perfect geometry um, might hinder that that expression and that process. Yeah, and also um, this piece has a message behind is to encourage people to take look at a bigger picture, right? Sometimes in life, you, you, what you focus on, you can focus on many a billion other things like challenges in life, like my case, right? But if you look at what brings life, what's beautiful, like the mountains, um, yeah, it can turn out to be beautiful after all. Yeah. Yeah. No, totally. That's, yeah, that's wonderful. Yeah. And that's, uh, what is it you, I know you mentioned, um, the mountains are, are something that's that's unchanging uh, mm -hmm. and, and and beautiful and something you can kind of uh rely on um are there i don't know you said that you're, you're still working on this series and you're thinking of, of jumping off <laughs> yes but uh what um what else do you think uh sort of would carry that same sort of feeling or would you go in a completely different direction in the future do you think yeah, basically I am, I love doing abstract paintings. I started mm -hmm. with doing huge abstract paintings. Like if you see at the back, the blue one, that is one of those where I created a feeling of a blue, um, like right at my house. <laughs> so um, because of a uh, space limitation in my studio, you know, sometimes how artists work and it is like we, we evolve according to circumstances, right? But I would definitely want to do um, abstract paintings again, huge pieces. And also do not just space limitation, my arm limitation. Yeah, I should like do the small stuff first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would never know what I'm gonna uh, do, but um, basically my rule of thumb is it has to inspire me. I can't do something just because somebody wants, to, uh, wants me to do it um, or um, somebody wants to pay me for it. <laughs> it's hard. It's the, I, I, I need the life. I need the um, inspiration to do it. So that is the core of um, why I do what I do. It has to be from deep within and it has to be genuine. So um, I do not know what will inspire me next. Um, uh, you'll see. <laughs> I don't even know. Like uh, Sometimes, like, I worked on this piece just um, a few days ago. I wanted to paint something else, but it, I wanted to paint trees, but it turned out to be like this <laughs> right behind. <laughs> I do not know why, because the moment when I paint, um, somehow some, it's like I had to go with the flow. 
how the color leads me and I just let it flow. So, um, well, it will be interesting to see what I'll come up with <laughs> because I don't even know. <laughs> yeah. We were talking about color um, a little bit with both of your work. And that's something that I've uh, been hearing from visitors to the exhibit um, is that they are so impressed um, with the use of color because oh. uh, when you're working with such a limited palette, um, it can be uh, too much uh, for people, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, or some might perceive it as monotonous, but each of you um, are working really smartly uh, with where you decide to put colors and what colors uh, you're choosing. What is it about these sort of, these cool blues, these blacks, these whites, these grays, uh, these soft yellows um, that you think makes your work, uh, that you think is suitable to, to your work and what you're trying to say and do? I think it very much flow back to uh, where I received, uh, where I first started art as a child. I started with pencil and paper, it's black and white. And when I um, had my formal training uh, in grade six, and I would say the first two years were very crucial to me. Um, that's where I master um, how to sketch beautifully. And I challenge my teacher. I always like challenges. And I like it when it seems like it's not a challenge, but it's a challenge to me. <laughs> Black and white, what's that the challenge, right? And my teacher would, uh, I remember he, him telling me this, never use a mechanical pencil for sketching. It's a bad idea. So my aim was to prove him wrong. <laughs> and I started using mechanical pencil. I came up with amazing work according to him, right? So, um, so I think when, after I stopped, um, practicing art for like 20 over years, when I get back to art, the limited palette stays with me. Because I think um, sometimes things that are simple can be more profound. You don't really need too many colors, but there are many beautiful painters who use colors, amazing. But at this stage right now, I just picked up where I left, I felt. So that's my journey. I'll slowly add on color. So the initial, when I do abstract, yeah, single color, but there are bright colors, like a whole painting of red, whole painting of blue, a whole painting of just maybe just one color blue, like that kind of blue again, or uh, just black and white. I didn't use many, many colors. Um, so because I was inspired by um, the nature here, apart from the mountain, uh, but mostly sunsets, the golden hour. So I started adding gold in my painting. So I, I would slowly add on um, colors carefully, selectively. And uh, yeah, eventually I, I might do some really colorful stuff. And now I'm secretly working on something that is still two, still one color, red, <laughs> red cloud. It's crazy. <laughs> It's a habit of mine, so I'm not sure where did that come from. But yeah, that's what I that's that's what artists are all about. We evolve. We we just try to figure out ourselves. Basically, it's not like we're trying to be something else, right? So um, yeah, I think it it has to do with my formal training. That that caused a limited palette. It's all my teacher's fault. <laughs> <laughs> I find that really interesting listening to Colette talking about um, <laughs> that, that you got the, the, the one of these connections of our limited palette. Um, I hadn't heard Colette's story about that before, and I can really relate to a lot of that is mm -hmm. printmaking because just by the nature of it, we carve a plate and then we do a printing of it. And it just generally is the black is one of the easier ones to do every color has to be conceived of as another entire work on top of it. And we layer these works on top. So just by the nature of printmaking, keeping colors simple means it's easier and you get the artwork completed more. And that's one nature's, but I've come to embrace that very much. And I've been playing a lot of the, with the um, washes, uh, trying to adapt more of the Japanese block making wash mm -hmm. system into the Western heavier mm -hmm. pressings. Um, through a variety of techniques, it would take too long to get into many of them. But this this uh, 
the simplicity that we, we've been working in, um, I really enjoy it giving the space for a viewer to enter into the piece in my sense, instead of me claiming all the details of the existence of the artwork. It <laughs> is. Um, by giving a reduced uh, mm -hmm. palette, mm -hmm. it, I feel it gives more opportunity to the viewer to um, enter in that sense. It's mm -hmm. they have to engage in it and the suspension of disbelief, they move into the piece rather than wait for the piece to speak to them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's 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 perfect um, because it is it is very accessible artwork um, that you've both created here. Um, like you were saying, Rick, like it invites you to walk in. Um, mm -hmm. And I think probably for all the reasons that you all just mentioned, for the simplicity, for the openness of it. Um, viewers have come in and said they found it refreshing, which was a really great uh, descriptor. I haven't really heard that too much uh, about exhibits being described that way. And that, mm -hmm. I think that has something to do with it, with the with the openness, with, with how inviting it is for people to just kind of come in and, and sit with each piece and, and mm -hmm. live in that world for, for a little bit. They, they kind of feel like, like they've actually been there. Been ah, breath breathe in that that fresh mountain air, or or that 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 crinkly dew in the forest. <laughs> they're they're imagining with what you're suggesting. That's great. Yeah. So uh, as we had said, uh, Panorama Personal Present and Past is on at the Silkhurst Art Center until May uh, 28. Um, that's something, uh, Panorama, uh, which, you know, uh, it's taking in a, a whole view mm. of, of an area. Mm. Um, and that is definitely evident in most of the work here. There's there's a few where you get a, a little bit close up, you know, on, on, a, on a peak of a mountain or something. Um, but what is about that idea of capturing the entirety of a scene? Um, why Why do that? Um, so I have, I don't know if I've stalled here. Can you see me? Yep. Okay. Sorry. Uh, I have the, the, in the panorama, I find it again, more able to enter the, the, the portrait is a statement, uh, an interaction, like a, you, you demanded to be in conversation with somebody. So something vertical wanting to be, um, completely dominating your your connection with them the panorama gives you places to go and places to breathe so it's it's not that in your face um one-on-one -on -one dialogue with the piece i find it more of a, an adventure or a narrative in the sense it could be set that way many pieces of, of a lot of the vertical paintings can do that through multiple elements but just based on the panorama format itself um it, it invites journey across a space yeah, for me, it's the same. I think if I do a panorama um, painting, I'm seeing things from a 10,000 foot point of view. <laughs> it's like my mountains will become smaller, but I'm seeing more of the mountains. And I'm seeing a lot more apart from the mountains, which is the sky and the sea. So if you look at the um, paintings at the exhibit, you get to see a lot more actually you don't see much of the mountains in fact is what is going on apart and in, in the midst or at the background of the mountain or beneath it you know so uh, panorama uh, is a very interesting way of capturing art it is not the it people usually overlook that you know when you are on the top of a mountain, if you climb to the peak of the mountain, you will look all around, right? But when you take a picture, you only take one side. <laughs> and it doesn't it doesn't um, justify the beauty of the whole area. So I think when we work uh, in a panorama um, um, dimension, it, it draws people in, 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 a, in, in deeper into the painting or into the piece of uh, art that Rick does, you know? Yeah. Fascinating. There's there's so much of a of a human element uh, in everything that you're all saying and the choices you're making. It's all very conscious of of your viewer uh, 
and, and the experiences that you hope they experience. Um, and also the humanness of you coming out into the work. I think that's that's very interesting how, how mm -hmm. conscientious you both are with uh, with the viewer. I think that's that's fantastic. Such a, a personal approach to art making. Um, it's it's more than just here's what I have to say. You know, <laughs> I think that's that's a that's a pretty wonderful thing um, to invite people into your world like that. That's really nice to say, Stephen. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, uh, thank you, Rick Herdman and Colette Tan for uh, talking with us and sharing your sharing these insights and your inspirations and your techniques and sharing your beautiful uh, and impactful artwork. Uh, again, you can see Rick Herdman and Colette's artwork in Panorama, Personal, Present and Past at the Silk Purse Art Center uh, until May 20th. Uh, and if you want to learn more about Rick and Colette and check out their websites or follow them on social media, um, there's links to all of that in the description below this video. Uh, so thank you for sharing uh, this conversation with us. And thank you again, Rick and Colette. Hope, uh, hope everyone watching gets a chance to see this artwork and, and, and follow these two great artists and uh, see everything they do. Thank you, Stephen. Thanks, Stephen. Thank you, Colette. Thank you, Rick. <laughs> I have to say, it's great how <laughs> how you're each other's cheerleader too. Uh, <laughs> I admire his work. Fantastic. Same. I, I, I secretly I, I, wants to learn that, but it confuses me because it goes reverse. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think yeah. it's been a very natural pairing, uh, Stephen. You've done well putting these together. Yeah. Amazing. Great fantastic, uh, fantastic working with you. Uh, and we're happy uh, to share your artwork with everyone. So thanks again. And uh, to everyone watching, take care. And we will chat about art next time. <laughs>